Actually, uh, because you, you took two hours to get out here, so that's why there were, it was a hard slog. It was a hard slog. Okay. Well, actually, going through 66 must have been pretty hard, right? No, <laughs> 66. Yeah, we were coming, to, you know, rush hour was going the other way. So okay, great. Not, not a problem. Can we bring it up a little bit? Sure. Yeah, just crank that thing up. Okay, great. So we always like to start. Uh, we always like to start um, on a personal note. Um, your background, so. You know, let's let's talk about like where were you born. You know, uh, what did your parents do? Maybe you can talk a little bit about your late brother Alan mm -hmm. and uh, and how how you know how this thing all started. So let's let's start let's start with you. Okay, I'm going to take your questions as like a jump off place. Okay, <laughs> so I was born in Newport News and uh, I grew grew up in Newport News, Virginia, until I was about eight. Moved back to the Shenandoah Valley, and I say back because that's where my mother's family came from. But I think what might be interesting to people is to consider my, my last name is Stoltzfus. That's an Amish name. So my grandfather on my father's side was Amish and they uh, became Mennonite. So if you know what Mennonites are, it's an ethnicity and it's also a religion and it was a, a very conservative religious Upbringing, um, for instance, uh, my parents would not have had a radio when they were young. Before I was born, after I came along, I, you know, they got radios, but you could only listen to certain things because, you know, a lot, large part of the world was evil. So. But uh, just to tell you a little bit about my background, so that while that was true, my mother, who was a, a writer and a gifted speaker, and was not recognized by her church, she started a radio program in 1951. So I'm just saying that to give you a little bit of a picture of the culture of my family. Okay, cool. Um, so let's let's talk about like, um, because, the, well, let's, let's go right to the Rosetta story, the Rosetta Stone story. I mean, this is truly like a story of brothers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was, looking for speakers, and, and I had run across the Rosetta Stone story, man, I was like pulling a Kleenex, because I was like, wow, this is beautiful. We gotta get Eugene out here. Um, and basically, like, you know, your brother had approached you with this idea, um, you know, learning, learning language. And so, can you kind of like, just step us through like how he introduced you? Because I mean, you know, I mean, your you know, brothers is not, it's having that relation with brothers is actually, it's actually tough. I mean, I come from a, a, a family of three boys, mm -hmm. and so when your brother is, you know, older brother, mm -hmm. That's right. he comes to you and he says, "Hey, I got this idea." Yeah. You know, you have one of two choices, right? Yeah. Number one, you're going to do it, or number two, <laughs> I want to kick your butt, right? So yeah, yeah. Let's, let's let's talk about well, that. It, it didn't work quite like that, but uh, in 1984, he got this crazy idea to use computers to present images, sound, and text, and give you choices. That was the fundamental idea, make a little game. And, you know, and if you, anybody knows anything about computers in 1984, they couldn't do it. They couldn't handle the text, much less the pictures and the sound. Uh, well, how did he know that it couldn't handle this, the, the uh, data? It's because he actually talked to my brother-in-law, John Fairfield, in 1984. They were swimming in North River, there in Bridgewater in the Shenandoah Valley, talking about language learning. They both had learned German. 
my brother was uh, studying, trying to study Russian and was very frustrated. They had both learned German in Germany, where they were in an immersion environment. And so they, they got this idea, and John tried it on computers and it wouldn't work. So they just forgot about it until 1991. John said, in the summer of 1991, I don't know the exact what was happening. I was actually living up here in D.C. Uh, John said to Alan, I think computers can do it. So I think. <laughs> he didn't know, but he, he, he sat down and programmed. And he right. did an original little, little uh, program called Rebound that had three images. And you could run, they took some photographs and recorded some voicing and did some translating and put a little program together and the computer did it. So it was time to go. Wow. So then <clears throat> they did this in the summer and the fall and I was living up here. I went home for Thanksgiving and they were all excited about this program that they were developing and they showed it to me and I cracked a joke. I said, you know, I could quit my job in D.C. and come and work with you guys. So <laughs> that's actually <laughs> where it <I> started. <laughs> So they, you know, kind of pounced on that. And uh, if you might remember, 1991 was the previous two back recessions. There was one in 91 and one about the turn of the century and on up till now. Uh, so it was a good time for me to, to leave the architecture firm that I was working for and do something that looked like it was going to be really exciting, might make some money, but was certainly going to be high risk. Okay, so that, uh, you know, that's really interesting because what was your brother thinking? I mean, you're in the, you're in architecture and, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, like how come he, how come he was thinking, oh, let's bring Eugene in. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was his thinking there? I mean, because obviously you're from a different, I mean, different background. I mean, did he see something that, that, that was kind of like a diamond in the rough? Or, I mean, how? He, may I speak freely? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll shut my pile, sorry. <laughs> he saw somebody that would be engaged and be pretty smart about it and share in the risk and the rewards, but he didn't actually quite see what I saw because when I looked at what they had done, it was really rough. The images were rough, the people, didn't look good, uh, you know, their clothes were like whatever they were wearing that Saturday morning when they shot the, the images, and the, uh, you know, it would be a junky car, so a man is in a car, a man is driving a car, and it's a junky car, you know. So what I saw was the need that they had for somebody who was concerned about the look and feel of the program, because it was never going to go anywhere uh, in uh, the marketing end of things. It was... It was never going to be appealing if it didn't look good. So that's why I was willing to come on board. And first thing I did was I threw out everything that they had done. I mean, how much how much money did they spend on that? Because it was must have been a lot of money. They spent a lot of time, more than money. But at that point, they hadn't really started the company. They just done this little prototype. They spent a lot of time on it. It's very painful for them. But I came on as the as the photographer. I was also the first recording engineer, and I did a lot of other things business-wise, but um, I just, I sat down with them and I said, look guys, this has got to look good or it's not going to be accepted. So we got to reshoot all the pictures, we got to have standards for what the models look like, the kind of clothes they wear, the kind of settings, the, the background, and so I went to work and actually my brother wrote out, he said, okay, what are you going to do? How are you going to get these pictures? I said, in six months, I'll have more pictures than you'll know what to do with it. And he wrote this down, and he made me sign it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, we had a very cordial relationship, but it was also serious. And this is before when, Pinterest, obviously. What? Before Pinterest. Yes, before Pinterest. So it was, you know, it was very... Uh, Serious, but I was totally ready to go because I had come up with a way to do this. See, we had, uh, and I'm gonna, I'll go through this a little bit because everybody, when they start things, thinks maybe they have to do things in the, like in a regular way, or in some way that you might imagine you're going to do things. But it turns out you often can't do things in the way that you think you should, or the way that experts will tell you how you need to do it. So everybody knows that if you're going to do something like this with actors and with script and photography, 
you need to have script, you need to have actors, you need to have a set, uh, or a site at least, you need to have a, a cameraman, you need to have lights, so you can have lights, camera, action, all this stuff. Well, we did that. We hired some models, actors, and set the whole thing up, shot pictures, took them back in the office, grabbed the stills, put them into the Rosetta Stone program, and ran it, and it was dead. It had no appeal. And we didn't have money to go, you know, the next level up, hire professional actors rather than models from JMU. Uh, you know, professional photographers, professional lighting people, all this. We didn't have the money to do that. I went out on the street corner in Harrisonburg where um, parking deck comes to a corner. There's an intersection there. I went up on the top level with my camera, and there was a road crew down in the intersection digging a ditch, a big ditch with tractors and workmen standing around and shovels and hard hats and clothing. And I had done enough script writing. We had been writing script. Of course, everybody did some writing of script. Um, I had done enough to know the kind of thing we were looking for. So I stood up there with my camera, and while I was looking there, I was writing script in my head. The man's hat is on his head. The man has the hat under his arm. The fat man is leaning on the shovel. You know, the man's pants are dirty. I was just writing script, writing script, writing script. I came back in the office, and off of one two-hour tape, we got 365 pictures because the people were grabbing pictures were also writing script in their heads. So we ended up, in about four months, we had five rooms with 18,000 pictures on the wall to write script from. So we did everything backwards. We took the pictures first, you know, kind of writing script in our heads, but the script that the people wrote wasn't the script I saw when I was taking the pictures. I just took pictures. And so there was the answer to my brothers, you know, making me sign this thing in a couple months. We had 18,000 pictures on the walls. You know, a room this size would have had one, two, three, four, five, six rows of four by eight sheets of plywood all sides lined with these pictures. And it's from that that we wrote script. And I'll just go on to say, you know, if those pictures had been on a computer in sheets or some kind of flow, it would have been really hard to have written the script. So just because we're in the technology world and because you all, you know, live with computers doesn't necessarily mean that computers are the best way to always do things. Because when we were done and we had those five rooms, all those pictures, 18,000 pictures, script writers were writing script, and I remember somebody saying, I need a picture of a man with a big hat, okay. contrasting small hat and hat with no hat and hat with cap and all this stuff. And I remember one person said, okay, far room, lower left corner, the back panel, there's a um, one of these beaver hats. You know that the that the Brits have. You know that who is it? What do they wear? Oh, the, uh, guards. guards at Buckingham Palace. Should be sweepers. So I mean, because the human memory could map those eighteen thousand pictures, and so that also tells you something about Rosetta Stone and how it works, because you're not told what something means in words in English, and then you figure out what that word is in Russian or Thai or whatever, you have an image and you can see the boy and you can see the boy eating the apple. And you see it and you relate to it and that's why Rosetta Stone works. Right, right. So that's why I wanted to get more into the mechanics of it because Rosetta Stone, how many, how many of you guys use Rosetta Stone? Okay. Great. Oh, great. So, I mean, the point is, is that you guys use intuitive mm -hmm. images and then it's almost like the mind will put it itself together. It's almost like you, you use Lego pieces and then they just kind of like, it's, it's, things starts coming out, right? I mean, you had mentioned that people can, um, uh, they know more when they hear versus when they speak. So that was kind of like on that realm of using pictures where it's very easy. So let's talk a little bit about, about that, how that came about, that using pictures. I mean, I know that, how did, did Alan come to you and say, He's showing like a bunch of pictures, and he's like, "Can you learn Russian now?" I mean, they, uh, how how did that thought process? I mean, how did he approach you with that? 
Well, they had developed this little prototype that had the Texas Soundland pictures, and it was working. So, you know, you'd hear a description. Basically, what it is, you hear a description of one of the pictures, and you click on it. That's, that's what you do when, you, when you're learning Rosetta Stone, what, uh, learning a language with Rosetta Stone. What, you don't really realize what's happening. I mean, I, I ran through a chapter the other day just to see what the latest program was looking like, you know. And I ran through this whole chapter of German, and it got out at the end. I don't know how many words, but I probably learned was being taught 30 words, and got to the end, and I said, you know, I, I got them all right, but did I learn anything? And then I heard myself saying, you know, er ist, you know, he is eating. Uh, she is drinking the coffee. You know, I, I was hearing this stuff come back. So, um, it was, I would have to say that my brother had some insight into how you might be able to, teach using images and playing this game, but he didn't really understand the power that it would have. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that will happen, and I'm sure it has happened to some of you and will happen to you. You get an idea and you do something, and then you find out actually, wow, this whole thing is more powerful than I imagined that it was. I mean, that's, that, is, that is the fun of discovery. And that was one of the things that was so, so much fun about Rosetta Stone was we were inventing something from scratch. There was no, there was nothing out there, anything, anything like it. I mean, in the language learning world, if you told somebody you were using a computer to learn foreign languages, they thought you were kidding. Uh, they thought of flashcards. They had no idea of the power that you can get from a picture. And this is really the key, of, key to it. And and we had, we didn't understand this till we got into it and we saw that it worked. And then we were trying to explain it. When you look at the images, you'll see an image of a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, and one of them is drinking coffee, another is drinking orange juice and uh, chocolate and water. And you don't realize, as the cues start to come to you, you're looking at those pictures and you're taking meaning from those pictures that's non-linguistic meaning. And then you hear the language to describe it. So you're looking at, and you know that the difference is going to be between coffee and orange juice. You know there's going to be a difference. So you pick up coffee and you think, okay, what's going to be the word for orange juice? Because I know it's going to mean, you know, this orange, it's going to mean orange juice, but I don't know what the word is. Then you hear the word soft in German. So, wow, it sticks. And we didn't know that it was going to be that powerful. And after we developed the program and started to sell it, we had to look at the program and figure out why does it work? Because we need to be able to talk about it. One thing I haven't said that you might have picked up, my brother was an economist who was selling real estate at the time that he started this. My brother-in-law was a computer prof, artificial intelligence, he would have called his field. I was an architect. Uh, one of my sisters who helped write script at that time early on was a lawyer. Uh, one of my nieces was an English teacher. Um, another niece uh, was still in college and she was in some kind of science program. A uh, nephew was in college, he later went to law school. What you haven't heard is linguist, because there was no linguist at the beginning. And after we developed the thing and were trying to figure out how to talk about it and needed to know more about how linguists talk so we could talk to Spanish teachers and French teachers, we brought in a linguist to look at the program. And she sat down, she ran through it, she looked at it, and she, she sat back, she said, you know, why didn't a linguist think of this? Well, there's a good reason why linguists didn't think of it. Linguists were taught how you learn a language. They knew all about grammar and structure and lists of vocabulary words, and translation, and all that stuff, which doesn't result in Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone had to come from some other place. You know, that's, that's so this is, this is a very good topic here about, you know, disruptive technology, because... It's, it's disruptive technology. Right, well, it's extremely disruptive. I mean, okay, so, you know, Clayton Christensen, um, he, he's a Harvard professor from, uh, I mean, from Harvard, and he wrote this book called Innovator's Dilemma. And basically, the, the idea of that is that the incumbents, in your case it was lingu linguists, 
they, they, they're so concerned about their um, client needs that they forget and they, they're very dismissive to like the new technology, Kitty Script technology. And what he said that is that slowly but surely they kind of overtake you know, the 800 pound gorilla. So in your case, Rosetta Stone was the disruptive technology, right? And, and it's almost like you guys were like the Wayne Gretzky uh, uh, skating toward the puck, right? <laughs> and then everyone else, like these language, language uh, labs and linguists, you know, the, you know, they don't know what hit them up, up, upside the head. So can you just talk about like the whole, how did you convince linguists that this was, this was it? I mean, mm -hmm. and then you had talked about, you know, maybe using children to mm -hmm. convince, okay, let's talk about how, how do you convince language teachers that this might teach language? Because there's tremendous resistance, generally speaking, tremendous resistance from teachers. And you, you can still find it. Uh, in the world of language learning in a lot of schools, uh, there's, they still don't, they haven't made this, the, the hop. Um, okay, so we've, we've, we've had a lot, we ran our program uh, for a lot of kids, a lot of children, a lot of teachers, a lot of, of adults. We just naturally uh, would test anybody and everybody that came along. And so we learned a little bit about how to show the program. What we found out is if you show Spanish to a Spanish teacher, she'll look at the program, she'll run through and she'll say, yeah, I can see it's a bunch of flashcards, but you know, I'm, you don't learn anything. So what you do with a Spanish teacher is you show her Russian or Japanese or um, Swahili. You don't even show her French because she's probably studied French. You don't show, show her German because there's too many cognates with English. She probably studied German anyway. You show her something totally foreign. So she's thrown in knowing nothing like you are at the beginning of Rosetta Stone. You know nothing. And this, these words and these concepts start coming toward you. And after a while, you begin to make some connections and you have this like, ah, I see how it works. And then you start to click. You know? And when a teacher has this moment, ah, then she knows that her kids can learn Spanish because she could learn Russian. And there's another little trick. You can sit a couple of teachers down, <clears throat> let's say, and you have them doing Russian or Swahili or Thai or whatever. And, you know, everybody's a little bit proud and everybody thinks that they can learn language or the flip side of that is they're a little bit shy and afraid they can't. And, and so everybody's like tense and stuff. So um, I was working with uh, Chief Billy we were trying to get Chief Billy of the, um, what's the tribe the, in uh, Florida? Seminoles. Seminoles. To, we wanted to do a program to teach Seminole to their children because they were losing their own language. They were stopping speaking Seminole. And so we had to convince Chief Billy. So I went down to Florida, out to the Everglades, out to, it's not really a reservation. The Seminoles have, have never been, uh, never signed a treaty. They were never... Um, subdued. It's a nation of Seminole Indians down there. So I went to, to where they were and I met with Chief Billy and thank God Chief Billy brought his little boy, his eight-year-old boy. Because Chief Billy I could see was going to be a little bit, you know, proud. And there was an elder sitting across, we met in, the, in a cafe, a big cafe. There was an elder across kind of watching and in a tribe like that, the chief is beholden to the elders. And Chief Billy couldn't show himself to not be like smart or whatever. So Chief Billy and I talked about this, but I took my laptop, set it over, got his kid over there, and got his kid playing Spanish. And the kid, for a half hour while Chief Billy and I talked, this kid was just, you know, playing with Spanish, learning Spanish. When we were done, you know, there was a no-brainer. So we did their language. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I was just sitting here listening, so I kind of lost track here. So, Should I keep talking? <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll keep on talking. Let me read the question. Well, um, actually, so let's, let's, let's go back, because um, a lot of folks here, um, you know, last time, the last meeting, people were like, hey, yeah, you, I need, you need to ask more pertinent question, you know, my startup, you know, and, you know, let's ask about, like, bootstrapping, like, how did you bootstrap? Ask right? me questions. Or, no, no, that, that's a little later, but uh, let's talk about the bootstrapping days, okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, it's interesting because like in 1984, 
uh, the idea went into Alan's head, and it germinated, right? It germinated for about yeah, like six, seven years, right? Nothing happened. Nothing happened, right? And so, so wait, I mean, was it was it because because a lot of folks here have ideas, right? They have the next Rosetta Stone mm -hmm. idea, so to say. Yeah. But I mean, they do. Go for it. And then, <laughs> and you know, what steps? Like, when when do I say, yeah, now it's time to make the leap? Like, when when you guys did that leap in 1991, right? Mm -hmm. When you started it, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, talk about the whole process, like how that came about, when you decided to jump, and, and then even like how you got financing, um, you know, and, and things like that. So let's, let's talk about the beginning days, how it yep. started. So, 91, we had proof of basic concept uh, in the fall of 91, but we didn't actually start the company until basically January of 92. And so it helps if you can like quit your job and not take any salary. So we we were we were living on savings, but you know we were living in Harrisonburg. I was I was living here working in an architect's office here, uh, and when I decided to join the thing, I was actually working in Harrisonburg and Chicago for an architectural firm. I was going back and forth, and. Um, I quit that, but I had to tie things up, so it wasn't really till March 15 that I was full-time, but I was about half-time in Virginia. So it's not very expensive to live in Harrisonburg, so that's nice. I mean, our families were from there. We started the business there because we were from there. Uh, my brother lived there. My brother-in-law lived there. So it helps if you have those advantages of not needing too much money, but we had uh, as many as 14 employees very early on during the script writing phase, and we had to pay them. We couldn't, couldn't everybody. Uh, this is still boot, bootstrapping stage right here, right? I mean, yeah. This is from your savings. Well, but we had we had a grand sum from my mother. Wait, from your mom? From my mom. Your mom? She, mom she seeded was, your, your startup? My mom was the angel. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Mama said knock you out. Yeah. Hey, she was, crazy. Your mom. You can't say she was gullible, but she believed her <laughs> sons, and she believed in her sons. But my mom was very entrepreneurial herself. Okay. And a uh, younger part of her life, uh, soon after she got married, before she started the radio program, okay. you know, she had four kids from the age of six months to five and started a radio program. So if anybody's raised kids, they know how impossible that would be. But around, in those years after that, she would do entrepreneurial things. She would buy furniture in one location and sell it in a, and drive it 200 miles and sell it in another location. And she had other people do it. She invested in rental properties and did a lot of things that I didn't even know about it until years later when I read the book that she wrote. So she was very entrepreneurial. Um, where was I going with this? No, 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 it's just, it's just uh, the oh, yeah. bootstrapping. She, she dug deep and pulled up $30,000, which, of course, is nothing now. So this is after college? After going to college? After who going to college? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, no, she, she, that was the angel contribution to Rosetta Stone was $30,000. Right, right. In 1992, okay. we started the company. We, you know, we brought... Um, you know, no salary, and uh, we took no salary, and we worked all the time. And but but we had to pay rent, we had to pay phones, we had to pay electricity, we had to pay a few other people. So my mom's thirty thousand dollars. Then, see, this has been ninety two. We would have run out of that money probably in uh, ninety summer of ninety three, maybe before, and we had to refinance. So we didn't go to to venture capitalists. We were too greedy. We didn't want to give any of it away. We believed in it. We wanted all of it. <laughs> we went to bankers. We mortgaged some properties, some of my mom's properties, some of my brother's properties. I personally signed on a note for $60,000 with no security. You know, the banks in Harrisonburg at that time would do this if they knew you. You know, it had to do some with our family background and the whole relationships that we had with the community. We'd had loans before that we paid back. So we, I think we generated about $150,000. Uh, <clears> and that money then began to run out. We got down, it would have been, 
I think my dates are a little wrong. I think we ran out of my mom's money in 92, and then we ran out of this money in the summer of 93. Uh, we were down to the last $10,000, and then we began to make some sales. And from there, you know, we made it. So actually, so talk about your first sale. And Big sale. 1993, yeah. some young woman in Richmond, you yeah, yeah. Um Talk about the whole story, because like that, that's actually really a good story because of what she believed in you guys. Because yeah. if you talk about the whole integrity and... The, this was an unusual sense. woman. Uh, the school district there uh, south of the James River in Richmond, Mrs. Basperville was her name. What's the school district down there? Does anybody know? Can't think of it now. You know, she was one of these gutsy people. She saw the program. She tried it. She, you know, somebody tried her and did it for in Russian or whatever. She could see, she could learn. She said, okay, I'm going to buy it for my schools. $10,000 order, which in those days was a pretty big order for schools. And in fact, it was a, a bigger order than we even knew. We thought, well, you know, these things are going to kind of tumble in. Well, they didn't, but they didn't that fast. But she, she, this was the summer of 93. She made the purchase. And then at the end of that year, the beginning of 94, was when we met two sales guys who were selling some software uh, that another company had developed ostensibly to teach English. I say ostensibly because it was an awful program. And we got a little notice in Macworld magazine. They just said, you know, Rosetta Stone, immersion software, no translation, no memorization, no, no lists of words. It was like this, you know, it was literally that big. And I, I took that thing and I cut it out I put it in the middle of a page, I took the masthead from the magazine, put it across the top, glued this thing up as you would in those days. Uh, we didn't scan it, you know, all that stuff. Didn't have digital of it. And, you know, made a little sheet for publicity. And somehow that got across the eyes of uh, a gentleman by the name of Don Kappas, who lived in Texas. He contacted us and he said, I think I can sell your program. So he came and started to work with us in the fall of 94. At that time, he would make sales to schools by the first, he would begin the sale process, the demo, talking to them. And one of the last things that he would do in their relationship with them is he would um, do a proposal. Sounds like a simple thing, but it's a proposal, you know, you want this many copies of this language, so on and so forth. He would call to me, I would fill it out, print it, fax it to them. So, late that spring, I had sent out, like, I don't know how many of these with this guy, Don Kappas, and, you know, we were waiting for the end of the fiscal year when everybody spends their money, and I said to Don, you know, what percentage of these proposals do you actually close? And he said, I usually close about 80 or 90 percent. You're printing money. Oh, my God. And he did. They closed. And then we were in business. From then, uh, within about a year, we were profitable. And But, you know, we didn't have much expense. We kept everything under control. I might say something else about that, because when I was talking earlier about how, how you start uh, something and you don't necessarily do what experts tell you or what is generally thought of the thing to do, after we developed Rosetta Stone, a couple years later, a gentleman by the name of John Wagner from California, found Rosetta Stone, came to meet us, he started to sell it, he was a sales guy. Well, this was after he had spent a million dollars on developing an English language program. Why did he spend a million dollars? Because he had a million dollars. His dad was pretty rich, his dad funded it, and they did everything in the proper way, and they had like linguists look over it, and they had, you know, all the proper things done in a row. And it had no life. I don't know if it worked or not, but nobody bought it. So one of the things that happened by me going out and shooting pictures in, in public, which is the way I got those 18,000 pictures, um, and there's a whole story there because you can't just take a picture of somebody without them uh, really giving you a release. Um, but he, I forget now where I was going with this, <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, so you were talking about the, the, 
So this is actually the part that we were talking about sales and scaling the business. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, selling the business. Oh no no no. I mean um, the what that right? Sales and scaling the business. Scaling. scaling. Yes. Yeah. So he he couldn't he couldn't sell his own program, but he could sell ours. Right. And it was because we didn't have the money to just do everything we imagined. We were forced to do it and find another way to do it. And the pictures in those. The first Rosetta Stone, those pictures are all gone now for various reasons. We rewrote the script and we also needed to have a whole lot higher resolution. But those pictures had life because they were taken out in the street, out in real life. I mean, I was up here at the, at the uh, zoo taking pictures, you know, for the program. So you can't have an image of somebody if they're recognizable without having their permission. So I was up there at the zoo. And a woman came along with her dog, and I said, can I take pictures of your dog? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm doing it with a video camera, so I'm taking pictures of her dog. And I say, um, I'm shooting pictures for language learning software. Can I use your dog in the program? Oh, sure, you can do that. So then I, I zoom back, I get back, and she, you know, her dog's running around. I say, okay, I'm getting you in this too. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So I pull out the release and give it to her. She signs it. I even videotape people signing it, so I had double proof. And uh, so then I had permission. So what did I have? I had a woman who was playing with her dog. You know, he was jumping over the, the leash, and she was walking here and walking there and across the curb and into the zoo. You know, I had this, these great shots. And this person wasn't posing, and she was comfortable. She wasn't uncomfortable because I said, will you walk over here and let me shoot a picture of her, and then she's self-conscious. So the, the photographers had to learn that kind of technique. Later in the program, uh, everything was reversed. We wrote script, we hired actors, um, had you know lighting uh, specialists and everything, but that was a whole different thing, and it was, it was right for a later time. But the first, I, I will say this, that the images from that first old program had more life than the pictures do now, but pedagogically, you've got to have what they have now. It's much more sophisticated. Right. I mean, so I, I like that because, like, you know, the secret sauce to a lot of the, what a lot of accelerators say is, like, you need three co-founders, right? You need a hacker, hustler, and designer. That obviously, you you guys had all the three components, right? I mean, you were the designer. Right. I didn't you were the designer. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, you're like, hey, you know, uh, it's got to look right, right? And then yeah. John was the was the hacker. Fact, yeah. And then Alan was the the hustler. Hustler, driver, pusher, shover. Yeah. Right, right. So that's <coughs> idea guy. The idea guy. So ideas on top of ideas on top of ideas. Yeah. So he so, needed somebody to manage it. Right, right, right. <laughs> that, was, that was my other job. You were to manage my brother. <laughs> So, um, so that's that, that. That brings up a really good point about co-founders. Okay, like dynamics in the team. A lot of folks here, you know, in your case, you had four, right? You guys had four. four like Greg, John, yeah, you, and Alan, yeah. pretty much, right? Um, do you think you might have had a little bit on the heavy side of, of founders? I mean, or do you think that was a perfect? Was was that perfect? Well, John did the initial programming for the prototype. He was a prof at JMU, mm -hmm. and he continued in that that job and he consulted with us but at the beginning he wasn't he wasn't full time with us. It was Alan, my brother and I, and Greg, my sister Kathy, and you know half a dozen other people. Uh, but it was Alan and Greg and I that were main main stage. But then three years in, uh, no it was less than that, two I'm not sure, two or three years in, Greg decided to go back and get a PhD. So he left. So it was Alan and I then we roped John back in. He quit his job at JMU, so John came yeah. full time with Rosetta Stone. But it, it wasn't heavy. It wasn't heavy at the top. We needed all the skills we could all bring to bear, and we needed all the different points of view. And this goes to another thing, which I'm sure you're, you're going to get to if I don't. But you have to have opinionated people, but you have to have people who are willing to offer an opinion and listen to a reaction and change their opinion. So, I, I, I'm just touching on that thing here, but, you know, we built a company, Rosetta Stone. We built a program, uh, the language learning software. More than anything, but what that built was us mm -hmm. as people. 
Okay. We learned how to do stuff. We learned not just business skills and management skills, but this. And you all know this. Anybody that's gone into business or, or works in any kind of an intense business environment, you have to grow psychologically. You have to learn how to work with other people, how to draw the best out of other people, how to let other people draw out of you without you being attached to your ideas. People have to be willing to, you know, take a whiteboard and put up an idea and somebody else put up another idea and you go through the whole process and you have a big conversation and everybody forgets your idea because you've gone on to where the conversation led. And that's a question, of, that's a matter of not identifying with your own ideas, if that resonates with you. You gotta put them out there. People will say, here's an idea. Five minutes, we got five minutes. Here's an idea. We got ten. Ten, all right. I'm not an advocate for it. It's just, you know, it's advancing the conversation. So I'll put the idea out there. Somebody else has an idea. Nobody should be attached to their ideas. And this is a you know, it's always an ongoing thing, but if you're going to be entrepreneurial, if you're going to do things that are new, that's where you have to engage, and that's where you personally, you personally grow. To learn to put ideas out there that are just ideas, not your ideas. So ideas not attached to people. Yeah. Just ideas attached to lots of money. Right? <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, what you're after is the best idea. Right. No, you want so a meritocracy. What are the best ideas? It doesn't matter. Where they come from, and again, as you work with people, you know, good ideas will come from the leadership, and good ideas will come from just people who are working, just somebody giving themselves to the project, any anywhere in the hierarchy of your company. Good. So that's a good sign for you guys for co finding a good co-founder. If he doesn't like doesn't like the you know rebuttals to his idea, then you know, might have to think about that, right? I mean, yeah, ideas if are people already... are tense and attached to their ideas, they can have brilliant ideas, but then you've got to spend a lot of energy fighting. Okay. You know, so sure. You also, you know, you work with people and, and you, people get broken down, and by that I mean in a positive way. This attachment idea can change in people. Okay. So you have to work with people. Um, so this is going to be the last theme here for uh, for what we're going to talk about, but let's talk about the importance of company culture. Because I know that a lot of folks here, you guys will hire, you know, talent over character, right? Because you can get the job done. It's almost almost like our startup culture is kind of geared toward that, where it's meritocracy, like just get it done, right? You can do it, great. You know, I don't care about, you know, anything else. What is your opinion about that? You know, I know you talked about trust, honesty, hard, you know, good work ethics. Mm -hmm. How important is that? What did you guys do at Ros Rosetta Stone to ensure that that company culture was intact? It's absolutely critical. I, I think my company culture actually started with my family because um, we had a free exchange of ideas in the family and it was kind of like a meritocracy as a kid growing up. Uh, if you said something and you couldn't defend it, you, you make a strong statement, you couldn't defend it, man, the rest of the kids were like hammering on it. It was five of us. <laughs> And, you know, we just, so we, you have to have integrity and respect for other people and uh, how you work at the best ideas. Um, and so really, in a way, it was, it was family and friends. It was, at one time, uh, all five of us worked for the company. My brother, Alan, and me, and my sister, Kathy, and my sister, Ruthie. They were lawyers. They were the legal team. And then my sister, Helen, was a salesperson on the West Coast. Um, that and the friends, you know, Greg kind brings that kind of ethos from his family. And Matt Shank, a guy who came on later. These, these people all had a lot of personal integrity. And that really, as much as anything, shaped the culture. Now, you don't all have the advantage of, you know, of that. And, um, but you need that kind of uh, ethics and that kind of relationship. Uh, after my brother died, and <clears throat> some months later, uh, Tom Adams came on board as CEO. Um, Tom understood a lot about the company, he had an intuitive feel for the, the culture. 
that you're talking about. He had, he's Swedish, but it, it was just, you know, he felt it, and we could feel that he felt the culture. But he said, you know, we need to talk about the culture. We need to figure out what are our values. And so we started to talk about it, and we started first saying, you know, our values should be this, our values should be that. And then we flipped the thing backwards. We just said, you know, it's a good company. What are our values? So I'm going to read them to you. Sure, sure. Yeah. So he put together this little, <clears throat> these little yellow posters, stuck them around the office. But Tom drove this, this search. You know, what, what is, what are the values at Rosetta Stone? <clears throat> So, they come in pairs. <coughs> Take responsibility, serve helpfully. Set high standards, maintain integrity. Nurture creativity, be original. Experiment judiciously, grow intelligently. Be passionate, think big. Build the future, don't forget the past. Speak up, speak out. Play together, play hard. Create evangelists, change the world. We got that on tape, so you guys, that's notes for you guys later. But what, what's wonderful, it's awesome. And, I mean, this was the culture, and it took Tom to tease it out and to put it in in this. But it was it was a very good thing then after, you know, 12 years or 11 years of, of company to have a new guy come in and say, hey, there's a culture here, let's document this. That was a really powerful thing. So... So you think that's obviously uh, you know a lot of these corporations have these big uh, mission statements and they'll say like the five principles. You, that, was that on, was that like posted on every wall in, in the? Oh, in the, we put it on these oh, right. little, little things and handed them out to people. And then we had big posters on the wall here and there. Okay. It, it was. I think the thing that was great about it was that it wasn't something that was imposed. It came out of the culture. It came out of not just our family, not just our friends, but the people that we attracted. And that, that is bringing me to another topic, and that is your character is a magnet to attract other people like you. So it's very important to, for you to have a strong idea of, of your own ethics and of your own character and to look for people who will foster that. You know, none of us are perfect. All of us have limitations. All of us have weaknesses. And so you're not going to find perfect partners. But you want to look for people who have in themselves a, a magnetic center for respect, integrity, honesty, thrift, hardworking. You know, you have that or you wouldn't be here. And you need to respect that and you need to foster that. And the people that you bring into your company need to help you grow that. Awesome. Um, we're, we're, I have one last question here before we go quick Q&A. Was there something else you wanted to talk about? I mean, there was, there's just so much we could talk about, and I, I, I feel so bad that we didn't I hit do up. have another thing. You do? Okay, what yeah, is it? You can still ask your question. Sure, sure. Um, so, obviously, people are here for a reason. <laughs> they want to hear you speak. And just looking at your, your past um, profession, you had a truck business, Right? I, I, I bought it, an 18-wheeler and hauled produce okay. from the west coast to the east coast and hauled swing sets and chocolate back to L.A. so I could buy a farm so I could plant grapes and build a house. But yeah, yeah, I was like, so that's the next one, right? That's, so you were, you were your farmer, you had a vineyard, I had right? Vineyard, yeah. And then you were a theater manager? I worked in theater at JMU. I was a lead carpenter. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, architect? Yeah. And then software engineer? Not software engineers. Okay, okay, I'll... I'll I manage start. software engineers. Okay. It's like herding cats. How about... <laughs> adding, <yeah. laughs> or managing architects. It's all about the same. <laughs> Very good. Um, so how about adding another one? Another career? No. Startup advisor? Oh. <laughs> I'm would you be Would you be open for that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, you know, ask me a question, I'll give you my opinion. Sure. So, like, let's just let's get a show of hands. Like, how many ed techs do we have in here? Okay. How many linguists? All right. How many startups? Okay, great. Yes! <laughs> um, 
So we'll we'll uh, we'll open up the uh, the floor for questions. Okay. And uh, one yeah. thing I was going to say, real sure. quick, people will tell you. You've heard it before. You can have fast, good, or cheap. Any two. They're wrong. You've got to go for all three. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. That's the only way we produced Rosetta Stone. We didn't have any money. We had to do it quick. And it had to be fast before we ran out of the little money that we had. And that forced us into doing pictures, for instance, the way that I did them, instead of spending a million dollars yeah. to, to make a program. So you need the compression of all three of those. I mean, sometimes you have to spend the money. Sometimes it just does take longer. Yeah. But you don't yield up on any of those without really serious consideration. You need the compression of all those things. You need to do it quick, and you need to do it cheap, and it's got to be good. The urgency. All right, here's your water. Um, so we're going to we're gonna um, open up for Q&A. So we're going to do things a little differently. Okay, so the person who can ask the first question is whoever has the most business cards. Because, uh, okay, how many cards do you have? From tonight? 50? Oh, you mean other Yeah, other people's business cards. Yeah. No, your own. <laughs> I'm not going to be very specific. Okay, so who has the most business card? You have the right to ask the first question. I have three. <clears throat> Anyone else? Four? Shoot. Four? Okay. What? You got... Oh. Say shoot. Uh, <laughs> He's what, a boss. <laughs> what country have you been to that you'll always go back to time in and time out because it's just that interesting to you? It's beautiful. You love the country, the language. I imagine you've been all over the world. So what is that one place that's special for you? Oh, man, that's terribly painful to choose. I tell you, there's, Japan is an absolutely incredible place. The culture is very peculiar. It's you know, a monoculture, and you'll never get into that. But the art, the architecture, the beauty, uh, the aesthetic sensibilities, incredible. Not to mention they have Zen Buddhism, which is also a wonderful thing. Uh, well, I'll stop there. There's some other great places. Okay. Okay, so Andy here, you had four cards, so sure. you have the, the right to ask the first question. <laughs> so, so how do you uh, bring about new languages or new products? Um, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of market demand. Your current customers may ask for certain languages. Um, what goes into the assessment of actually bringing a bringing on a new language. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just for what it's worth, I'm no longer in the administration of Rosetta but I can answer the question. We kept a list of all requests, and generally speaking, uh, the ones that had the biggest number of requests were the ones that we went after, uh, because we, we basically figured out we could do any language. So that's really what... It, it's that and also perception of how many we could sell. You know. Okay, next question. Ron, there you go. Great, great to hear the beginning. Thanks for coming. Sure. Um, it's great to hear the beginning story of, of how Resident started and, and the, the capital that you raised. And, and of course, I know the, the current story, but I'm really curious about that mushy middle. So it's uh, you know, going, you know, getting to the point of going public. And, and I'm really curious, especially about the, the tipping point. Okay, you were able to make those first couple sales, you got those salespeople on board, but did you, did you end up going for a real round of venture capital? When you did, did you get pushed to go to the Silicon Valley, as they always try to do? I mean, how, how, did, you, how did you end up growing? What was that tipping point? How did, how did you end up going public? Okay, we actually were able to make enough sales uh, to um, not ever have to go for capital. Uh, it's, it, 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 we did the company, uh, we ran the business in many ways different than you will hear people recommend. We never had a budget. We just you know, looked at every idea that came down the pike and said, is this worth doing? Will it pay for itself? How does it fit with all the balance of all the other things? Can we afford it? And we ended up, in a few years, we had a lot more money than we were spending. So we had a little bit, you know, we didn't have to decide, okay, there's only $100,000 we can spend here, so it's going to have to be this, this, or this. We basically, any good idea that came along that we believed in, we implemented. We didn't go way, way over the top uh, because it didn't suit our industry to do that. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you could do, you could do 100, 
hundred thousand dollar ad campaign and you don't ever pay off but you got to do little tiny things in our world that worked so <clears throat> the biggest hurdle was to go really in my mind the biggest hurdle was to go from the small family-owned company grow it and then then we actually sold the company to uh, ABS and Norwest Capital. We actually had an inquiry, uh, let me say this judiciously, um, what got us thinking that we were at the place where we could sell, so we got an inquiry from the largest international media company in the world. So I don't know what names come to your head, but I think I might still be under a confidentiality agreement to not say who that is. <laughs> But if you think of an international media company that's uh, you know huge and everywhere, it's that company. So they made an inquiry, and we had to get our act together. We had all the financial records, but we didn't have it structured right. And we had a lot of things to do, so it was about a year and a half it took us to get ourselves ready. And then we went back to them and said, okay, we're ready to talk business. And in the meanwhile, they had had it an international crisis that went straight to the top of this uh, conglomerate and they were not talking acquisition at all. So we had to go find somebody else to buy us. It couldn't be an English language company because we had all these other languages. It's ESL is a different world than foreign languages. It couldn't be a foreign language company because they didn't know what to do with the English. So you know it was about 50-50 value here. So we, and rather than going to an education company, we actually ended, just, ended up going just to private investors who just bought Rosetta Stone because it could make money. Then they took it. With Tom Adams, they took it public. And at that time, I was, I was not there. But I can tell you the event, the change of control event to sell to those, those private investors, I'll just say this to, to you. We went through that process, and I don't know if you've ever been through an acquisition, but <clears throat> you basically auction the company off. You, you get bidders. You, you know, you need a professional banker to help you here. You auction the company. You get to the highest number that you can get. You make a commitment to somebody, and that's when the real work starts. Um, actually, it was a lot of work up till then, but that's when an army of accountants and an army of lawyers go after all of your records and try to tear them apart so they can get your sale price down and because we had behaved ourselves and didn't buy expensive yachts and didn't hide anything everything was like cards up in our records between us each other and in our records and during the final negotiations when the lawyers and the accountants were asking questions shooting you know hope uh, books of questions at us and we'd answer and chapter and verse and this and that. Between the time when we initially bargained on the sale price and the time we sold, the price went up. Because things would come, would happen um, that, you know, weren't actually spelled out in the agreement as who gets what. You know, so this contract lands from the Army. It's going to be $1.4 million or whatever at that time. <clears throat> who gets this money? You know, we fought to get that money. And we, I mean, we worked really hard up till the, the we were supposed to close at 12 o'clock one day, and it was in, in Baltimore. <clears throat> we couldn't agree on everything, and it went through the night, and up at like 11 o'clock, I took a nap. Everybody else was negotiating. We broke at about 3 o'clock in the morning, go back to our hotels, everybody was exhausted, and by we, I mean both sides that were negotiating this thing. And I forget exactly what happened. We went back to the hotels about 4 o'clock. We got a call to come back. So here these people hadn't slept all night negotiating, you know, millions and millions of dollars in sale. I had had some sleep. <laughs> so one of, these, one of these deals came up. It was, you know, it was like, who gets this $400,000? And I said, look, we need to get it because of this, this, and this. And I looked at the and then opponent, you know, the negotiating other side, I said, I'm asking you to fold on this because this sale is not going to happen. 
if we can't make this happen. And for this, this, and this reason, Rosetta Stone should get this $400,000. They folded. We closed. That was it. Poker. Okay, I think we have time for one question. Okay. One more question? Sure. Okay, so. Um, Thank you. Um, sir. I just wanted to ask you a question about marketing. I know you talked about uh, that sales guy in the beginning, but uh, obviously you guys had a very strong marketing uh, strategy. Uh, could you talk about more about what the strategy was behind it and how it came about, et cetera, how you guys became so successful? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, I don't mind going on a little longer or two if we want to here. Yeah, we have 30 our... minutes? 30 minutes? All right. 30 more minutes? <laughs> sure. Uh, it's a very good question <clears throat> because this is one of the way, one of the places for Rosetta Stone that we completely misanticipated how marketing was going to go. We saw our market as being primarily colleges, universities, and high schools, possibly. Uh, governmental agencies uh, and coming right out of the blocks we found out that colleges were not interested. College language programs are run by profs who are interested in literature. They don't ca care how the freshmen and sophomores learn. So the freshmen and sophomores are being taught by uh, assistants, professor assistants, uh, graduate assistants. So there was nobody there who had like a vision for language learning in the college, in the university. So you can just forget those sales. So we ended up finding this sales guy that I was talking about in Texas. Um, he sold to high schools, uh, Spanish, French, German classes, and ESL. ESL, as I said before, is a whole different world. English language, English as a second language. A whole different world than foreign languages. The people in those worlds don't even talk to each other. They don't even know that each other exists. But ESL is big because it's funded by the government, by state governments, by the federal government, and obviously the need is great. There's a lot of immigrants here that need to learn English. So at first, we thought it was going to be universities. It turned out to be those schools. For At first, that was 90% of our market was education. Another big part of our market was bundling deals. We had some bundled deals with, with Dell and some other bundling deals. In other words, Rosetta Stone would go out with computers when they were sold. Apple at the time was big into schools. And so we bundled uh, for about two years. The company survived because we were able to bundle with uh, uh, Macintoshes. And at, at those t in those days, you know, from 25 cents to a dollar was what you got for every machine that went out with your software on it. We had a deal with Apple Japan. Computers going to schools over there, we got five bucks for every computer that went out with Rosetta Stone. I don't know how we negotiated that. I mean, we negotiated that like we did everything else. We just, you know, worked hard at it. Uh, we tried to never leave money on the table uh, in that kind of a relationship. Do we have time for maybe one more question? I have time. Really? We can go until 3 in the morning if you want. <laughs> All right. All right. When learning a language, one thing that strikes me as really important is that people stick with it over time. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on, on what Rosetta Stone does really well to keep people engaged over time? And if there was something that you were going to improve about it to increase engagement, what would it be? I don't know as much about the most recent developments as you know people in Rosetta Stone now because I'm no longer uh, in the administration. I, I'm a shareholder, a small shareholder. Um, I think for me, what worked then, and I think probably works now, is uh, the feeling of success. If you go in and you begin to feel success, is like I ran ran that program the other day. Uh, you know, I was learning. You know, that's what makes people stick. There are some other things that they could do uh, in terms of my experience <coughs> online. I just did the demo online. If you buy the whole program, you get a whole package. And what we tried to do in the early days, that whole package um, was the software, but it was also a book, a very simple book. It didn't have any rules of grammar, nothing of that sort. It just simply had the words of every chapter 
of every line. So you could flip through that thing and you could say, shit, I learned all this stuff. Because how do you remember what you learned? With language, it's funny because it doesn't all come to your head, but when somebody says, you've been studying Russian, and somebody says in Russian, you know, when is the next bus going to come to the bus stop, and you understand it, you know, you're done. But it's, it's in that experience of your life that you know you're having success. Okay, so, wait, one more question? One more question? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> okay, one more question. I've actually uh, worked with my brother on apps and stuff like that in the past. I know working with family can be a bit uh, tenuous. Uh, did you guys run into any rough patches that kind of threatened the business at times? Yeah, my brother and I, I, mean, I was about 44 or 45 when I went back to work on this, and he would have been three years older, and we hadn't done anything together since we were teenagers. I mean, you know, we met at family reunions and occasionally did something together, but we didn't spend time together. Um, so we just jumped into this thing. Uh, but I would say, in our case, because of a habit that we had of uh, dis discussing things, hammering things, arguing, you know, with, with integrity, that we could kind of take this on. That being said, um, <clears throat> We did run in, into some rough spots. I mean, I was a very stubborn person. And um, he felt that there were times when he felt that I was not uh, compromising enough. And he actually talked to my sisters about it. My two sisters are the lawyers. They're also mediators. They're professional mediators. And they sat down with us and we had a little chat. <laughs> And, you know, I was, I was very stubborn in that chat, but it still made a difference. I changed myself a little bit. <laughs> All right, so we always ask our guests one last question. One last final question is probably going to be the most difficult. So, <laughs> who's your favorite superhero and why? Yes. I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah. My favorite superhero is a guy who, brilliant scientist, thinker, logistician, you know, think logically, but he said there's nothing more important than a good intuition. Albert Einstein. I know he's not exactly the superhero. I know, yeah, yeah, I know. So but why? He, he, he's a great guy because he, he was much more than a scientist. And he was more than heart. He was a very spiritual person. Yeah, so like when you told me, I was like, well, you know, Albert Einstein's not a really superhero. So I went on the internet, looked them up, and lo and behold, there was an action figure no! <laughs> Einstein. So no! he already told me the answer. So I actually got this on eBay, from eBay. That's very expensive, by the way, because there's not many. It's they don't make heart. Right, they don't make mass production there. So. Hey, man. <laughs> so Wait, wait, hold on. So I just looked. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so excited about it. Okay. I just wanted to just close the comment. I mean, this interview is actually really a tribute to, you know, you and your brothers, your late brothers, in their in your success. Basically, your whole innovation and tenacity had really changed the world. I mean, ultimately, you know, you weren't just translating words, right? You were actually translating concepts that put governments societies and cultures together mm -hmm. and ultimately change the world. So thank you for coming out. So ladies and gentlemen, Eugene Stoltzman.